Hello everyone, this is Ty Sletter here. Mary King. And this is the first edition. Brought to you by GTA Sports Network. So if you haven't already, make sure you follow GTA Sports Network on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like the page, subscribe to the official YouTube channel, GTA Sports Network for more content like this. And first and foremost, with all due respect, we're gonna do ladies first. So why don't you break down what we got today for ladies first, Mary? Uh, we're just gonna cover the WNBA and okay. their proposal for a return. All right, we got women's hoops, baby. Let's talk about it. So, originally the season was supposed to start May 15th. Okay. Obviously with the COVID-19, that put a huge delay right. on the season start. But with this proposal, hopefully, you know, finalized on Monday, um, we'll be able to see a return for a 22-game regular season that okay. will start July 24th. Um, like, back to back is going cool for that's a lot of back to back. Right. Um, the site is looking like it's going to be IMG Academy in Florida. Okay. Um, originally, this season is 36 games, so they're losing a little over 10 games for the season. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my only beef with what they laid out as far as the re return mm -hmm. would be that, you know. With them having fuller seasons overseas for people that play overseas, right? Um, they're isolated a lot okay. and not with their family right. while they're over there. And then to come back home where you're supposed to have more mm. of a support and fan base, um, this kind of definitely limits who can bring family or some sort of support system with them. Gotcha because of the location and just the and limited, situation. Limited availability, yeah. Right, so like players have to have at least five years experience. Only those people can have a plus one. Oh, wow. Um, and then they'll have to pay for this person's living expenses, essentially. And then wow. as far as the teams that make the playoffs, um, then players would be allowed to bring, like everybody would be allowed to bring a plus one. Again, that's super, super strict, strict, um, and specific, and it's kind of unfortunate um, for those players that ain't been in the league long enough. They really yeah. don't have no no say so. Anything. Exactly. Um, my my take on it is this: just off the rip. Uh, for those that don't know, the WNBA is an extremely shortened season that usually fills in the basketball gap from the NBA finals going into the, you know the NBA's training camps, um, <laughs> basically giving you basketball all year round so with COVID I feel like them already being at a disadvantage by having a short season naturally losing those 10 games might not seem like much to like the NBA for instance because they play 82 games but when it comes to a season that's a summer sport basically one could almost argue or debate does it make sense to come back at this point Mm -hmm. Because not only are you going to run into all the other sports that you're competing with for media time, because obviously the, the NBA is making their comeback, which we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, you also got the NFL training camps coming. Um, a lot of fans that watch basketball, they watch basketball because two Bowl was back in February. Right. And fortunately for the NFL, their season didn't get affected by COVID because they ended their season right when it started. So they were able to finish everything they had going on. So they're the only sport, arguably, that didn't get affected by COVID yet. So all their fans are going to go back to watching football more times than not, the, the diehards, of course. So if, if I'm dealing with the WNBA, and, and we talked about this a little bit off the air, in regards to them being a, a league that's still trying to find ways to generate revenue, generate exposure, generate opportunity for, you know, more revenue streams, um... I want you to kind of tell the world what you kind of had an idea could happen hypothetically to give them an opportunity to grow and kind of talk on that a little bit. Yeah, so pretty much we were saying like if the W, not the W, if the NBA does not come back because of you know, players having um, a different perspective for what the focus should be right now. Right. Um, if the NBA doesn't come back and the WNBA does, because I, I feel like the women definitely want to play. Right. Um, then one that gives the world an opportunity to focus on 
the women's sport specifically for that amount of time that they'll be running. Right. So that, you know, should force the media to do what they should already be doing, which is give adequate coverage to the sport. Um, Basically give them a fair shake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And draw new attention and get more eyes on these super talented women that are putting their heart and soul into it, just like the guys, so... Of course, that would be kind of a stretch because only, like I also mentioned to you before, uh, the NBA not resuming, we're talking about a billion dollar loss, mm -hmm. up to a billion dollar loss. And then you're going up against the grain with their season running into the NFL's preseason. Uh, obviously, you got NASCAR going again, uh, just to name a few sports that obviously would deviate and take away from potential new fans of the mm -hmm. sport. Um, obviously, people like you and me, if the WBA comes back, we're, we're, you know, we're going to watch. We're going to be right, right there front and center. Right. But as far as um, new fans, um, opportunities to reach new people and expand, I, I agree that that would be an ideal situation, even though that's kind of a, like, a huge yeah. what if, yeah, if yeah. you will. Sure. Uh, but it could happen. It could happen. And um, we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But uh, the last thing I want to touch on about this particular situation with the NBA, um, it was reported by ESPN that they initially were negotiating 60% of the salary. Uh, of course, the, you know, the WNBPA and of course the players, so, you know, got, got, got involved with the association and they renegotiated and ended up getting 100% of the salary, which I think is great. I don't think that's a problem because we are, it's not, um, it's no surprise or no secret, you, should, you know, if you will, that the WNBA players do not get paid nearly as much as the NBA players. They're very highly, grossly underpaid in a sense. Um, but then again, saying underpaid is based on comparing two different leagues too. Mm -hmm. When you got one that generates a lot of money so they can afford to give super maxes to a Dame Lillard, LeBron James, and, you know, James Harden, and the list goes on, versus a league that doesn't make it much of a profit as of right now. I'm not saying that because this COVID thing could definitely be a game changer. So I'm not gonna outrule that or like try to null and void that because that's definitely a possibility. But as it stands right now, with the, I believe the league is 20 plus years in, 22 years in, you know, give or take, um, they haven't turned that profit yet. Right. So my only question would be, and maybe you can elaborate this for you know the listeners: How do you pay players 100 percent of the salary? when the league itself that's paying and cutting these checks doesn't turn over a profit, where does that money generate from? Or where do you, and you don't have to necessarily know the direct source because I don't even think, it's, it's, I think it goes deeper than just right. numbers. Mm -hmm. But where do you think that money would end up being generated from in order to be able to fulfill those, you know, those, I guess that negotiation, that agreement? Like you said, honestly, it's kind of like I don't want to say forbidden territory to dig into or find out where they get the money that they do get right where they get it from right but I mean according to like this most recent article they just pretty much said when they renegotiated their CBA uh, I believe last year yeah I believe their CBA was up this time last year yeah so whenever they did that uh, collective bargaining agreement for those that don't know what CBA is, by the way. Right. Somehow, it, they provided um, increases in the salary structure. So they had to go in and break some stuff down and get it to a point where they could continue to, at the at the bare minimum, fund these players. I'm, that's a... <laughs> you know, you raised, you raised a, a great point. And you also gave me another question I had to ask you because something we didn't talk about. COVID did change the layout. Um, they had an issue with attendance. Mm -hmm. So with COVID, nobody's in the gyms now. So do you think by chance, because now it's almost an even playing field, there's no fans mm -hmm. at all for the NBA or the NBA. True. Do you think that there's a possibility that if they make sure that they get their media outlets together, whether it be through Twitter, whether it be through YouTube TV, like how the NBA does their finals, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you got NBA TV, you got ESPN2, just to name a few of their, their outlets that they get their games played and viewed at. Do you think there's a possibility that their viewership could go up? Mm -hmm. 
just based on the fact that, that the conversation is no longer about attendance in the arenas now because mm -hmm. nobody's allowed in arenas right now. Right. How does that affect the WNBA, good or bad, in your opinion? Based on based on history and, and where we at right now. Um, I feel like just building on what it was for the WNBA last year, um, I think they saw a substantial amount of growth last year as mm -hmm. far as viewership. And I feel like this could be another, um, not expected, but it could definitely be another window for them to get more viewers because as things continue to open up in the world, right. um, people are still glued to their phones in some way. Mm -hmm. um, true, true. So as long as I feel like they're being marketed consistently and they're targeting who they're supposed to target, then I feel like those numbers will prove themselves or show themselves. Uh I want to dive just a little bit deeper on that because you touched, you, you again, you're, you're uncovering a lot of things for me right now. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the viewers are getting somewhat of a free jewelry lesson, if you will. You brought up the fact that the viewership has increased a little bit in the last season. Mm -hmm. And of course, that the fact that there's opportunity there for that to grow and expand a little bit more with COVID and everything that's going on. What marketing strategy would you recommend no 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 don't don't do that don't do that i saw that look on your face i know it was, i'm not saying you know american go in there and save an entire league i'm not i'm not asking to do that that's 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 a, a daunting task it's going to take a, a team of marketing gurus to put that together but my thing to you is if you are in those boardrooms with you know commissioner kathy you know and you're able to if you were to ask any, any suggestions questions comments concerns Recommendations, if you will. When you can pretty much connect the players and other players or like staff members that play important roles mm -hmm. in making the league go, if you can pretty much just bridge the gap between them and the people and just create like a personable connection so that the people are getting to know the the women on a personal level okay um outside of the sport maybe okay um whenever you feel like you feel like you can relate to someone then you tend to like connect with them and you want to follow them to see what it is that they're doing just like we do on social media maybe you didn't even know they even play ball but you find out they play ball because you see us you see them on a a commercial for some shoes that you're looking at getting it can start from there and then just continue to grow hmm you, you're good at these like no, lead ups no. no you are you are because I, I think about it you just brought up the idea of a, a basketball player a women's basketball player doing a commercial for a shoe mm -hmm. and we talked about this off the air as well when it comes to shoe deals and my biggest question to you would be, just for the listeners that didn't get the chance to dive into our conversation earlier, why do you feel like women are less likely or haven't up until this point been able to get shoe deals the way men get shoe deals almost thrown at them on draft night? Sometimes before they get to the draft night, they get thrown at them while they're in college still. Mm -hmm. So why do you think women have not like really broke through the shoe game yet. outside of you know a couple you know marquee players like you know Adela Don, Mike Moore you know just name a couple that I, that I know for a fact have a shoe deal you know mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that is um just off the top of my head I feel like when it comes to guys <laughs> like because women wear shoes too so I mean women, yeah. women I would think women would be a top seller if you had a woman to, to like really support and follow, I would think women would buy more shoes. Women buy shoes. Definitely, they definitely buy shoes for themselves and you know, partners and whatnot. Absolutely. But I feel like when it comes to the guys and um, the whole shoe deal thing, um, if I was a big company like Nike, okay. and people already pay attention to the male sport of basketball. Of course, anyway. yeah, of course. So when they're 
performing at a high level, that's like obvious to be like, yeah, they're super good, super talented. We can sell some shoes with them because of their skill and talent, right. et cetera, et cetera. And gotcha. people will kind of just go with it. When it comes to the women, you still definitely have to be like top, top tier when it comes to your game, okay. for sure. But with the women, I feel like it's, it has to do with like, you know, their impact outside of basketball because a lot of people still don't know some of these players for face value because they play the game or like they don't make that connection off the bat. So it'll be more possibly for a reason like some community uh, influence that they may have had where a, a brand may want to associate with them because of that reason because of like humanitarian type stuff. The WNBA has been what it's been and I feel like a woman is more likely to speak on certain situations quicker than her male counterpart in mm -hmm. the same league just because of one repercussions okay uh two just like i don't know our makeup okay no 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 you're good you're good so here's what we're gonna do we're gonna, we're gonna take a quick break pay some bills but when we get back we're gonna talk about the nba the return and kind of what could possibly destroy this whole reboot of the NBA season of 2020? Uh, this is Ty Slider here with Mary King. This is Double Take, and we'll be right back, so stay tuned. And welcome back to Double Take. This is Ty Slider here. Mary King. And if you haven't already, make sure you follow GTA Sports Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like the page, subscribe to the official YouTube channel, GTA Sports Network, for more content like this. And now we're going to get into the NBA talk. Those that have been, uh, hopefully you haven't sleeping on the rock, the NBA is supposed to return at the end of July 31st. They slightly, possibly have talked to move the target date to July 30th. However, there has been a snag in the plan. We have players that have made it very clear that they don't want to play. Mm -hmm. Now, one would assume it's about COVID-19. Because that's what the media is still pushing. Mm -hmm. However, if you dig a little deeper and get past the possible virus still being an issue, which I'm not saying it's not an issue. Right. It's still an issue. Mm -hmm. But the bigger issue that's not getting the press that it deserves is the fact that right now a lot of players are protesting with the people in their hometowns. Yeah. Players like Russell Westbrook. You know, just to name, you know, somebody that's actually has something to lose because he is an elite player. He is a franchise player down in Houston. So he's down there marching with the people, protesting, you know, protecting what he feels is his rights as a human being. Um, but another player that's out there and, and, and making it known that he is with the people, Giannis Antetokounmpo in Milwaukee. He's making him, you know, George Hill, a uh, fellow, you know, Indiana native, is out there in Milwaukee making sure that he's doing his part. Mm -hmm. um, just to name some of the players that are out there that, that have something to lose. These are the, the names I name are players that are automatically in the playoffs right now. Their, their teams are going to Disney World. In July. Um, but the, the big issue, the big story that dropped recently is a player that's team is in the playoffs as well, but he is not active due to an injury. Uh, Kyrie Irving mm -hmm. is a player that spoke out against what he feels is systematic racism. And he feels like the NBA is a distraction that's going to take attention away from systematic racism, which is what the topic of this week has been mm -hmm. on all fronts. Echoing these same messages is former NBA champion Steven Jackson. Co-host of All the Smoke. If you haven't checked it out with Matt Bard on Showtime, great podcast. Salute to those brothers that are doing a great thing over there at Showtime. Steven Jackson has echoed the same things because he feels like now that the cameras and everything are, not, are no longer on the George Floyd incident that happened in Minneapolis. 
the world is still letting it be known that his name will not die in vain. This one man has had the entire country saying this man's name, along with 18 other countries. Those are just the stats. It's out there. You can look it up. It's not crazy numbers. It sounds crazy that one man has been able to harness that much influence and using it for positivity, using it for change. Mm -hmm. So the most recent conversation basically goes like this. Kyrie feels like the NBA is trying to change the narrative and believes that unless the owners speak up against these injustices and social reform, that the NBA players should not return and shouldn't play in Orlando. What's your thoughts on that? Well, first off, I just want to say, like, when it comes down to the the key people involved in these conversations, um, when it comes to Kyrie, I feel like um, you definitely have to take in consideration, like, who he is as a person, as right. well as, like, his history and his connection to the natives, the indigenous people, on top of the fact that, you know, I was wondering if he you was going to dive into that. <laughs> <laughs> On top of the fact that he is a black American as well. So, okay. um, like, this is something that's important for him on a super personal level as well. Right. And if he has, which he does, plenty of say and impact and influence. No question. Um, the yeah. man is is is. I feel like he's doing the right thing. Is using his platform for what he feels is right in his heart, mm -hmm. his mind, his spirit, and obviously his spirit is driving him to say, "Look, yeah. as much as I love this game, and in there's a direct quote, he said he's willing to give up everything he has for social reform. He's willing to give up everything. That's how priceless change." is to this one man who has the ability to be, I mean, no question, he's a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Not right now, he's still got time, but he his career is already on the way to Hall of Fame. Right. Um, you know, and he has room to grow as a player, but obviously right now, something that was echoed by the Hall of Famer, or, you know, somebody that's obviously a legend in the game, Steven Jackson, this is not the time for basketball. Mm -hmm. This is a, key pivotal moment in history and i think Kyrie and wants to make sure he puts his mark on it yeah definitely everybody is trying to do what they can personally to make sure they're on the, the, the right, right the right side of history right yeah. um now speaking of sides we have lebron james mm -hmm. a legend in his own right obviously hall of fame no question about it the chosen one as they call him mm -hmm. uh, obviously has made it clear and recently released a statement saying he does not believe that restarting this season will impact the Black Lives Matter movement that has been ignited, that has been, you know, continued to build upon. People are impacting it from East Coast, West Coast, South, North, all over the country and even all over the world. There are countries out there that are obviously standing up for George Floyd and for those other names that have been unfortunately buried in the annals of history. What's your thoughts on his stance on it? Because he's obviously on the opposite of this, thinking that the NBA should be able to resume. Yeah. And I want to get your take on that. Um, to a degree, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I feel like for him and his perspective, because he is who he is, and the massive influence and impact that he has oh, on man. not only the basketball His following world, is crazy. Just the whole entire world in itself is like, I don't, nobody really knows if there's like selfish motives, so to speak. Okay. Because of his personal situation and where he's at in his career. Um, but he's, it's probably like, yeah. you know, because there is the spotlight on Black Lives Matter right now. Right. He's heavily involved with it as well by restarting the league and while still having all these eyes on the league and him himself to see what he's going to do as far as the remainder of the season. Right. He probably feels like, well, 
this is an opportunity to capitalize on that. And, you know, it being LeBron James, I'm sure he has a couple things up his sleeve that we may not know about yet that True. he can use to kind of further push the the message and the change that we're all looking to see. What, uh, a lot of the response to Kyrie Irving is they're calling him the disruptor, right? Mm -hmm. Um What's your thoughts on that? And, and, and to add a little bit of context to that, one would ask, do you believe that if Kyrie's team, the Brooklyn Nets, were fully healthy and in a contention position to win the championship this year, would he take the same stance? Um, Honestly. Because that's, that's, that's where the, right. the disconnect is. Like People are like, okay, I've heard people even say this. He's not wrong. Right. But the timing just feels oddly coincidental that you're not only trying to stop LeBron from getting another championship, but your team is not in position to really win this year. Mm -hmm. KD said he's not coming back this season. He's going to wait it out. So it makes people feel like he has ulterior motive to stop everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's almost like, well, if I can't win it, nobody can. It, it, like that's kind of the attitude that people are, are kind of trying to put out there, connect or try, the, the narrative they're trying to spin. Like, okay, if Kyrie's team was actually in a position to win the championship this year, would he still say cancel the season? I mean, that's definitely obviously the debatable. But if we're gonna take basketball out of it just for a second, I mean, we have comes, to. When ultimately. it comes down to like what it is in the eyes of many people is if it's a matter of life and death okay yeah he has the the privilege of being an elite right. superstar with you know money and opportunities for himself and his family but if that can be taken away by you know a random police officer mm. I mean, what good is it then? Does it really matter? Does you know? Uh, like, I mean, it's tough. I mean, all the money in the world can't buy can't buy right. that back if they take your life. Exactly. You know, I feel like you kind of answered the question as far as like whose side you kind of you know kind of leaning towards on this. Yeah, I mean, if it's you like to pick a side, I mean, it's you know. it's like it's hard to be like neutral in, in times like these. Oof, oh, oh, and I'm oh, one of those oh, people. Of, like I'm one of those people that. <laughs> And pretty neutral for the most part. Like, I can see both perspectives. Right. But, but again, it's like, how do you choose between the two, the, the two extremes? Like, at the end of the day, basketball is still a sport. It can be, you know, impactful and change, a, a vehicle for change, for mm -hmm. sure. But so if we're going to do a black and white, then... Okay. It really don't mean nothing. So right? let's, let's let's put this in perspective for, for those that because you, you kind of you kind of went into deep waters there, and I don't know if they were able to swim that deep. That <laughs> basically what you're saying, to put it in simple terms, as much and th and this this actually hits harder because it's coming from you being a media person, being involved in this sport, being having the love for the game that you have, the IQ, the understanding, the knowledge. And yet you still say, even though basketball has done wonders and opened doors for you, to be at this place right now with GTA Sports, even though this is what we we started this thing on, you're basically saying, look, I love the game, and the game has shown love back to me. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to social injustice, when it comes to the change that needs to be made, the reform that needs to be led, it needs to be led by people who are focused on the change and not games. Right. Like if, like the ball's literally in your court, it's in your hands to make a move with it. And the end goal is to oh, like, man. <laughs> the end goal is to win the game. My you chest. Slam the oh, my and chest. that being like ultimate change for the world and for mm. the people that look like you and generations after, and you have the ball in your hand, and there's a few seconds left. Are you really gonna? Okay. You know what I'm saying? So let's let's address the elephant in the room, because little people know there is an elephant in this entire equation that could make or break the NBA's return. 
if we take a step, we, in order to understand what's going to happen going forward, we need to take a step back. Let's take a step back real quick and go back to March, where NBA owner Mark Cuban mm -hmm. was doing interviews, sharing his views on whether the NBA should return, and if so, how will we do it with COVID, and how how can keep players safe, his, his thoughts on it. And he had a lot to say about players not playing until we figure this coronavirus out. Now, let's fast forward past the corona hype and go into what's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter, the protesting, the George Floyd, um, the eight minutes and 46 seconds of the cop that had his, you know, had his knee to his neck and basically you know cut off his airways. Um, let's take it back to now. Where is Mark Cuban now? And that's, and that's, and that, and that, my late, late and jump, this, this is why Steven Jackson feels that basketball needs to take a backseat because NBA owners have been eerily silent. Mm -hmm. I say eerily, but unsurprisingly right. silent. Right. And that is what Steven Jackson called out when he went on live on, on Instagram. He said, where are these owners? Where are you at now? And until the players, being that this is a player's league, the NBA's player's league, they pretty much control the board of whether they play or don't play, mm -hmm. get paid or don't get paid. They pretty much move the needle. Yeah. He just let it be known to those that didn't know their own strengths and power that you have power and equity in this league. And you decide whether we play in Orlando or we stay home until we get these laws changed. Right. And that's another thing that made me think like <clears throat> in times like these, like it definitely requires sacrifice. Oh, and my chest. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty much is what tough. it is for like them specifically. And even for us as viewers and participants and fans, like, yeah, Absolutely. it sucks not having sports to watch it does. But when it comes down to it your freedoms and liberties that you take for granted essentially every day or you know you watching somebody who I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be <laughs> honest with you uh my my perspective on it has definitely been expanded in the last 24 to 48 hours because I think in the beginning of this I understood LeBron's point of view being a fan mm -hmm. and wanting basketball and, and then having the mindset of basketball brings people together mm -hmm. and that's not wrong right. it, does, it does but it does not settle the racial tension it does not solve the underlying problem if anything it just puts a band-aid on it mm -hmm. that wound doesn't heal right. fully and right. scabs can be ripped off prematurely by somebody who's racially charged by another George Floyd type situation, Eric Garner, the list goes on and on. The more that these killings and brutality from the police and, and people that have, you know, the, or feel the need, if you will, to take social matters to their own hands instead of treating everybody equally or giving everybody the same opportunities, especially people of color like ourselves. Again, it's just one of those things where I, in the beginning, was leaning towards LeBron's side of it, like, the NBA could be a big plat uh, a bigger platform when they go to Orlando and they represent and do like they did with Eric Garner with the I Can't Breathe and, and like Stephen Jackson even admitted in a video, look, we tried it that way six, seven years ago. It didn't work. Look mm -hmm. where we are now. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I'm going to tell you right now, I felt that. Yeah. Because I remember when the league was becoming more, I guess you could say, socially conscious publicly. Mm -hmm. You had players like a Kyrie Irving mm -hmm. and, and obviously Steven Jackson who always stood up for what they believed in. Mm -hmm. But to have the entire like entire franchises jump into it, like when the Donald Sterling thing happened and they turned their shirts inside out to, you know, combat the racism that, you know, because of the statements he made and he eventually lost his team because of that. Um again, it was like progress, but Six, seven years later, it wasn't yeah. enough. It wasn't enough. And the the big issue, again, to, to, to those who are just not tuning in and missed the elephant in the room, the NBA owners have been very silent 
ever since this George Floyd thing started. And that was Steven Jackson's whole stance, period, is that, look, if the owners want to make money off the players, that's what this, that's essentially what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. They have to make a statement. They have to choose what side of history, if we're going to make this. And, and, and I feel like about the, which statement, side they have to the make statements statement. in general are like the bare minimum. That's a start. That's a start. Right. But it's a real good one if you get right better than now, nothing. Right now, they're not giving anything. We we need a statement. We need actions that follow. Right. That's like visible, tangible proof that they're working with us to get the change that we're asking for. Because anything right. less is just like for what? For show. Exactly. Just for, inter need, for entertainment. That. And that was the, in that, in, in that, and not to, and to add to that, because Kyrie actually mentioned that as well in his statement. He didn't like the idea, and I don't know if he meant to take it as far as he did, because it might have went over people's heads, but he kind of kept, it's like he said it, so it's kind of hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. If you read the article where he made the statement, he basically was saying he didn't like the idea of a league that's majority black, mm -hmm. having all of his superstars play in one place yep. for entertainment. That sounds, sounds like a, it sounds like a couple things. Sounds like a yeah. setup for one, yeah. and it sounds like a circus for two. For sure. So he almost essentially, without saying, he said it without saying, mm -hmm. called players that go ahead and do this anyway, and they're not saying anything about it or not voicing their opinion about it. You're clowns. It's a clown show because the up unless the owners come out and defend their stance or at least make their stance known. According to Steven Jackson, if this is not the time to be silent, mm -hmm. you choose a side, and if you don't speak up for what's right, if you're not with us, you're against us. That's so good. that That's so good. he basically just drew a line of saying, yeah. And I think Kyrie, being younger and being active in the league right now, can see obviously Steven Jackson's retired, mm -hmm. so he has his fans and he also has his supporters in the league, right. but Kyrie is in the league. So him saying the same word as Steven Jackson gave him that much more influence because you got one of the new generation superstars to take your side and choose that stance and make it public. Because mm -hmm. there's probably a lot of players that feel what Kyrie feels, right. but they haven't voiced their opinions. They might be supporting from the back, from the shadows. Like, yeah, we with you. But they not really, you know, we, we not front line. You know, we not trying to be, you know, crucified for our statements. Because right. some people care more about the image than truth. I, I feel like that's what his pump faking statement was about. He felt like a lot of them were pump faking saying they supported him in the George Floyd situation. But then it, it ultimately turned out that they only were supporting him because they wanted to get clout. They wanted to get some of the shine, some of the attention. Mm -hmm. They saw the media turn towards Steven Jackson like George Floyd was his literal brother. Right. Like, like he lost a legit family member. Now, granted, they were very close; they grew up together, and so I'm not no no disrespect. But the media treated it like it was his blood brother. Mm -hmm. So naturally, other players saying his name, doing things on social media that are you know just like the social media challenges when when quarantine first started with COVID, everybody was doing push up challenges, mm -hmm. and they start doing the savage challenges. Like you come up with all these different challenges. This is a challenge. The NBA has to either come out and say they support their players in this move. They already, with the Player Association, approved that players will not get penalized if they don't play. The ones that are, that are able to play. If they choose not to go, they won't get penalized. And they're still getting paid too. Now, if I'm not mistaken, unless they've updated because they're still working mm -hmm. out the kinks. Last I checked, the report said that they weren't getting paid because they're not playing. Right. That's now, what I said. It's so a sacrifice. Like that, that's, that's where we are. Your, your source of income is definitely on the line. And and I've also heard reports. It hasn't gotten to this point yet, but something we kind of talked about off the air a couple weeks back. There is a huge possibility if the NBA doesn't get this season restarted. They're looking at losing up to a billion dollars in revenue from the moment COVID-19 started and if they do not relaunch in Orlando at the end of July. That, in my mind, 
going forward, I think that they're going to look at possibly ripping up the collective bargaining agreement. Before it's actually over? Or is that no, a like I'm talking about like down the line. Mm -hmm. Because that's coming up again. Right. And it's not being talked about. I feel like that after if they don't get this season ended the way it's supposed to and start the next season in December like they're supposed to, because this civil unrest that we're going through right now where everybody's trying to make a change mm -hmm. for black people, mm -hmm. it could be a thing where the players like Kyrie Irving and they can say, you know what? Not only are we not going to resume this season, right. we're not going to play in December. We'll take our money, our guaranteed money, and go start our own league. But I'm going to say that for another. They got, a, they got to subscribe to YouTube channels. This is what we're going to do. I want to thank you if you made it to this episode. This is the first episode of Double Take with my partner in crime, Mary King, who's usually behind the camera, but I got I had to get her in front of the camera. We need that ladies first. We need that. Okay. First and foremost. So if you haven't already, make sure you follow us. GTA Sports Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Make sure you like the page. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, GTA Sports Network, for more content like this. If you want to add anything? Any last words? No, you got it. All right, well, until next time, take care.